this is a cartoon about Alzheimer's disease. We might imagine that the woman to the left here has made some comment about her husband's increasing forgetfulness, and in his defence he claims, I'm living in the now. This is an article from the New Zealand Herald, arguing our economy will suffer if we ignore pollution in our lakes and rivers. And this is my mum, who in 2001 was diagnosed with a brain tumour. So what do these three things have in common? One answer is that they're all problems facing our country. Cancer, Alzheimer's, and keeping New Zealand green are all big challenges. Over the last two decades, cancer has been the leading cause of disease-related deaths in New Zealand, killing over 8,500 people in 2010 alone. By 2050, it's predicted that the number of New Zealanders living with dementia will have tripled to 150,000. And the current cost of just attempting to clean up eight of our polluted lakes and rivers is $500 million. Fortunately though, there's something else in common among these three things, which is that they can all be addressed using nanotechnology. So first question, what even is nanotechnology? Well, it's all about controlling matter at the itsy bitsy nano level. And by itsy bitsy, I'm talking about particles that are one billionth of a metre in size. So just so that we can all really appreciate this, or if, you, if you'll join me in a demonstration, take your hand, put it up to your head, no one's doing this, and <laughs> pluck a single strand of hair, unless you're balding, then I'll forgive you. <laughs> but look at it, it seems small, right? It seems really small, but you could actually fit 5,000 nanoparticles around it, okay? So why work with something so small? Well, in doing so, we can take advantage of the unique size and structure of the nano world which simply doesn't apply to other scales of measurement. At the nano level, particles don't behave like larger objects. Instead, they're dominated by quantum effects, which means that their properties can change depending on how big they are. And this should make everyone really excited. Why? Because it means we can literally fine tune the properties of these particles depending on what we want to use them for. So how could we use them to benefit New Zealand? Well, as we've mentioned, New Zealand faces a range of health issues, from cancer to diseases like Alzheimer's. And without a doubt, these pose profound social costs. They massively reduce the quality of life for the New Zealanders that suffer them, their friends and their families. So the biggest way that the nanotechnology can actually promote New Zealand's social wealth and well-being is by addressing our health issues. The field of nanomedicine involves introducing these tiny nanoparticles into the body to detect problems or repair them at the molecular level. When we treat cancer, for example, we can construct nanoparticles that are more sensitive to X-rays than normal body cells. And so we, when we combine this with radiotherapy, the cancer cells actually get destroyed at a much faster rate and we get a more effective treatment. We can also do other things like attach little biological keys to the nanoparticle surface to more precisely target drugs to different areas of the body. So we can use nanotechnology to improve drug treatments. But we can also use magnetic nanoparticles to better tell the difference between disease and healthy tissue when we image the body. So we can use nanotechnology, nanotechnology sorry, to improve detection and diagnosis. So do you see some kind of pattern here? We don't actually need a whole new paradigm to embrace nanotechnology. We can apply it to the treatments we already have and improve them. And given the number of possible combinations with nanotechnology, we can apply it to many different problems and case after case, make it part of the solution. So what about something big like Alzheimer's? Can nanotechnology really help us there? Well, Alzheimer's is characterized by two main things. The buildup of these clumps of protein called amyloid beta plaques and the death of brain cells or neurons. So first, we can use magnetic nanoparticles, like the ones we just mentioned, to make the amyloid beta stand out more when we scan the brain. And if we can accurately detect that amyloid beta, we can more accurately diagnose Alzheimer's and begin to think, think about how we might manage or treat the disease. And here, nanotechnology can also come into play with its potential to help regenerate those brain cells that have died off. When I spoke to Tim Day at the University of California, Berkeley, he was quick to tell me that nanoparticles can be used to create particular environments of cells, and that in turn can be used to control the fate of stem cells. Now, stem cells are kind of like the Play-Doh of the cellular world, if you like. 
They're capable of being shaped into many different cell types. So provided with a source of stem cells and the right nanoparticles, the brain could theoretically regrow its missing neurons. And that, that might allow functions like memory to be retained. So there's some great scope in nanotechnology for tackling our health issues. But what about our environmental ones? Well, it can certainly help us sustain and improve New Zealand's environment. The main way it can do this is by helping us to monitor and reduce environmental pollutants. So zinc oxide nanowires, for example, can bind to contaminants in water or soil. And when this happens, boom, electrons can move much more easily through that wire, creating a flow of current. So the amount of current that we measure is actually going to tell us the concentration of that contaminant. And the great advantage of the nanotech approach is actually that it's highly specific and it's highly sensitive. We can en engineer nanoparticles intentionally to bind to specific kinds of chemicals. We can even attach proteins called antibodies to bind to one specific contaminant. Because nanoparticles are so small, we can also fit heaps of them in a given area of space. So more particles means more binding to pollutant molecules, which means greater change in current, which means better detection. Using nanotechnology, therefore, we can actually detect pollutants before they become problematic. Detect trends as they become concerning and act preventatively before it's too late. For cleaning up pollution or remediation, things like nanoscale iron particles can also be used to detoxify a wide range of contaminants, from pesticides like DDT to nitrate-based fertilizers. And the reason that this works is that nanoscale iron particles can actually give up electrons allowing a reaction to take place. So in this case, allowing contaminants to be detoxified. So nanotechnology is looking pretty good for our health and environment, but is it really plausible? Well, you bet your strawberry-coated pavlova it is. Already, the promise of nanotechnology is being seen throughout New Zealand and across the globe. Research at the University of Otago has designed specific nanoparticles that are more effective at treating a very aggressive form of breast cancer. Victoria University students have used nanoscale gold particles bound with specific DNA to test for estrogens, a known contaminant in New Zealand waterways. And this isn't just some research pipe dream either. An article published in the Journal of Nanomedicine last year reported that 247 nanomedicine products had been approved for medical use or were in various stages of clinical study. Along similar lines, a 2011 study reported that a specific nanoparticle, NZV1, used to clean up environmental contaminants had been tested in over seven countries. So the reality is that nanotechnology, all, nanotechnology is already being applied to the kinds of problems New Zealand is facing right now. As its research base continues to rapidly expand, the plausibility of using it successfully only continues to increase. So to tie everything together, I'd like to ask one final key question. And that's, what's the business case for nanotechnology? So if we really want to embrace it, we're going to need resources like money and time for research and development. And if we want to apply it, considerations around policy and ethics also need to be made. And as you can see, this is cl collectively summed up by the massive amount of paperwork on the left. But what kinds of tangible benefits can we predict in the short and long terms? Well, in the short term, we have earlier diagnosis and more effective treatments. And that might just help us cut down on costs like the $511 million that we spend each year on treating cancers, or the $955 million on dementia. It can help us monitor and reduce environmental pollutants. And that might help cut down on costs like the $500 million that's being spent on cleaning up just eight of our polluted lakes and rivers. Over the long term, these kinds of savings give us the freedom to delegate more resource to innovation and prosperity, while improving the quality of life for fellow New Zealanders. Over the long term, we also have a healthier population in regards to certain diseases and reduce the corresponding burden on healthcare. We sustain and ameliorate New Zealand's breathtaking natural landscapes, helping support our $24 billion tourism industry. Our captive market and expertise in nanotechnology could also allow us to export health and environmental nanotech products across the world, helping support the $48 billion contribution that exports make to the New Zealand economy each year. Furthermore, we draw in talented individuals from across the world, and young New Zealanders in science, politics and business 
have a reason to stay by virtue of some exciting new career prospects. So to help bring us full circle, what really happened to my mum? Well, fortunately, doctors were able to operate and remove the tumour with such a success that she's actually sitting in the audience today. But one thing they did have to do to get access to that tumour was to cut the eighth cranial nerve on one side of her head. And that's meant that she had to relearn how to walk and that she's actually deaf in one ear. So could these sorts of issues have been circumvented with a nanotechnology approach? Perhaps. But remember, nanotechnology isn't necessarily about replacing treatments. It's actually about saying maybe we could do better. And maybe we can. After all, nanotechnology represents a plausible opportunity to solving some of New Zealand's greatest health and environmental challenges. Cancer, Alzheimer's, and keeping New Zealand green. Using nanotechnology, we gain access to properties that simply don't exist for other strategies. By working at the smallest possible level, therefore, we can use it to create tangible economic, social, and environmental benefits for our country. I believe that nanotechnology closely aligns with Sir Paul Callaghan's vision for New Zealand. But I also think it goes further than that. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a New Zealander that doesn't want less cancer, less Alzheimer's in the future, a cleaner environment. I actually think that nanotechnology appeals to a vision of New Zealand we all want to live in. So in all, nanotechnology gives us a great opportunity. And preparing for Eureka, one of the people I spoke to was Dr. Khalid Griesch at the University of Otago. And when I first walked into his office, immediately he began quizzing me. He said, what's nanotechnology? And of course, I began to explain the use of these tiny, tiny particles, only to be cut off by the no, 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 and the shaking of his head. And then he said, nanotechnology is the revolution of our time. And the question that we need to ask is that we want New Zealand to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam's mum. <laughs> Thanks, mum. Um, how would you stop the nanoparticles becoming pollutants in their own right? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, toxicity is, is one thing that's, I guess, puts nanotech in the spotlight, is are these properties that make it so great also their, their downfall in a sense? Um, and I, that really comes down to selecting the nanoparticles that we use. So, for example, um, zinc oxide nanowires that I mentioned. So Natalie Plank, who's actually with the McDiamond Institute, she, I was talking to her about them last night, and they really dissolve in water. So they do their job, and then they dissolve. So you've got no ex, um, issues around toxicity. In terms of the nanoscale iron particles, so NZV1 is an example of those, um, iron's sought after as a detoxifying material because it's, it's known to have very low toxicity. So it's basically a matter of choosing, okay, these, some nanoparticles may well be toxic, let's avoid those, but let's know the ones we know that are safe and in the sizes and with the ligands attached that are safe and let's go with those. You, I mean, was it Bill Joy who said, oh, you know, they're going to self-perpetuate and get out of control and take over the world? Um, I'm paraphrasing here. Well, are they going to take over the world? But, well. you know, I mean, people are very concerned. <laughs> uh, the fact that they can be self-perpetuating in some way. Self-perpetuating, that's yes. interesting. I haven't come across that um, in the reading that I've done. All right. Um, so I'm not sure how best to answer that. But based on, for example... Just going back to the zinc thing, I mean, they, they dissolve, so there's no way that they can perpetuate. How would nanoparticles plus stem cells advance the situation? I think you were suggesting they could be used for Alzheimer's. Why'd, what would the nanoparticles do? So the nanoparticles play a role in shaping the stem cells. So stem cells are basically have all this potential yep. to become... Anything. An, yeah, exactly. So the stem cells are really have a guiding role in the same way that particular... Basically, the, the way that those stem cells get differentiated into a certain cell type is they need to be in a certain environment. That's one of the key factors. And this, uh, the nanoparticles, that's where they come into play. They help create that environment. Before insertion in the brain. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is my kind of... Shut up, my friend wants me to ask about Eskimos again, but I'm, <laughs> I'm fighting him off. 
This Carry is, on. Yeah, no, this is my great um, theoretical uh, kind of interjection into this presentation as a neuroscience student. So the way I envisioned it was, yeah, culturing stem cells in, say, a petri dish in vitro, which could then be, um, yeah, using the nanoparticles to differentiate them into neurons and then putting those neurons into the brain. Thank you. Thanks, Sam.